Can I firstly, uh, as I formally start my presentation, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and their elders past and present? And as John has done, can I also acknowledge members of the O'Connor family? The National Trust, uh, both in our state and across the Commonwealth of Australia, plays a deeply significant role in the appreciation of and respect for all aspects of our heritage, including our built heritage and an important educative role for successive generations of the importance of our history and the understanding of it. Indeed, the Trust's formation in Western Australia had as its impetus the protection of the barracks at the top of St George's Terrace, within which C.Y. O'Connor had for a time his offices as the state's engineer in chief. The Trust lecture series, the C.Y. O'Connor annual lecture, held both in Perth and Kalgoorlie, celebrates the deeply significant O'Connor legacy. O'Connor is one of the most significant figures in the relatively short history of the colony and then state of Western Australia to date. And I'm honoured to be invited by the Trust to deliver the 2014 lecture. Like numerous generations of Western Australian school children, I can trace part of my primary and secondary school education back to that visionary decision by WA's first Premier, John Forrest, to bring the genius of C.Y. O'Connor to Western Australia. Not just to bring water to Kalgoorlie from the hills of Perth, but to expand the railways and build a port at Fremantle. My two sisters and I were born in Narragin. I spent all of my primary school years until grade seven in Narragin and Southern Cross. Two country towns, like plenty of others in our state, part of and influenced for the better by O'Connor's great works. Whether I first learnt it in a classroom in Narragin or Southern Cross, or from a grade seven social studies textbook in Perth, or indeed later in life reinforced by reading what I regard as the best work on O'Connor, his life and legacy by A.G. Tony Evans. I knew that these two small towns in the Wheat Belt and the Yilgarn had for all time been changed by the impact of O'Connor's works. Narragin, a railway town on the Albany Line, would not have flourished without the water supply that came from the, from the post-O'Connor agricultural expansion to the Goldfields water supply scheme. Narragin was first opened up by colonial settlers in 1860, but it wasn't until the privately owned Great Southern Railway from Perth to Albany was completed in the 1880s that the town site, which had been selected as a watering point, began to develop. O'Connor himself travelled on that private railway line from Albany, following his arrival in Albany from Wellington via Melbourne. His train joined the government line at Beverley for his final leg to Perth, and as Tony Evans says, no doubt gave him time to contemplate aspects of one of his projects, the expansion of the state's railway system, still an ongoing vital piece of our infrastructure, whether public or private, whether for passenger freight or agricultural or minerals commodities. Southern Cross in the Yilgarn remains variously a minerals resources town and or a wheat belt town, depending upon the cycle. However defined, it is of course, it, it, however defined, it, it of course sits on and is dependent upon O'Connor's great pipeline. It is striking distance from the number six pumping station, a site visited by me both in my youth, youth and as a member of the House of Representatives. There are of course thousands of such an anecdotes touched by O'Connor from generations of WA families. In that sense, all of us raised in the gold fields and the wheat belt are personal witnesses to O'Connor's work and legacy. But to either intentionally or inadvertently restrict the, the view of the legacy to water catchment and supply, the Goldfields pipeline, the Mundaring Weir and the state railways does O'Connor a grave disservice. While it is the Goldfields pipeline which captures modern and popular iconic status, one can mount a most respectable case that the creation of the Fremantle port was his greatest engineering work and one without which the fledgling state's capacity for interstate trade and commerce, let alone international trade, would have been crippled from the outset. What was his greatest engineering feat may well be a matter of dispute among engineers. 
of whom O'Connor, in our context, was a leader of his class, as Brunel was in his. But more of engineers later. While this lecture series has been delivered around the time of O'Connor's death, this evening lectures marks the first decade of the series and is the fifth to be delivered on the actual day of his tragic death, 112 years ago at the age of 59, on the 10th of March, 1902. This evening is an opportunity to reflect not just on the engineering, infrastructure and economic le legacy, but the social legacy as well, including what might be described as a literary, indeed cultural, legacy. In recent days and weeks there has been, rightly in my view, favourable publicity about Perth in the New York Times by travel writer Baz Dresinger, including Perth's in inclusion on the NYT top 10 go-to list. Indeed, this is almost certainly the most favourable publicity in the New York Times since the early 1960s flyover by NASA astronaut John Glenn of the City of Lights, repeated when, Jen, when Glenn joined the space shuttle flyover in 1998, and much more recent flying visits to Perth by Secretaries of State Rice and Clinton. And as John has uh, referred to, Secretary Clinton's visit included a stop at the Trust's Curtin family home in Cottesloe, a deeply significant part of our national heritage, which exists today only as a result of great work by the Trust itself, strongly supported by successive state and federal governments. While Dressinger's New York Times contribution may have received more publicity, a more long-lasting favourable historical critique of Perth will surely be David Wish Wilson's recent quality history, simply entitled Perth, which illustrates how O'Connor, his life and legacy, has become indeed part of our psyche. And I quote, Tony Jones's statue memorialising the engineer C.Y. O'Connor is my favourite in Perth, despite the tragic subject matter. The statue is part of the living environment rather than a static image lodged in a public place. And its horseman sits stirrup deep or soused to the neck, depending upon the tide. He arrives in the waves at roughly the place where on the morning of the 10th of March 1902, Wilson then goes on to describe the death and then goes on to describe how each year, now on O'Connor's birthday in January, descendants swim to the statue to perform a small private family ceremony. He also writes of the public outpouring at the time of O'Connor's death, the largest funeral held in the state up to that time, and the statewide reverence with which O'Connor is today held. Indeed, on the 10th of March 2002, the centenary of his death, over 100 people walked to the statue in the early hours of that Sunday morning to pay their respect. Jones's statue at the now O'Connor Beach is neither the first nor the largest statue in O'Connor's honour. More well known is Pietro Porcelli's large statue of O'Connor at the Fremantle Port Authority, a statue which dwarfs even those to O'Connor's hirer, Premier and subsequently Lord Forrest. Which Wilson makes the point that as a revered figure with a tragic end, O'Connor is ready-made for literary representation. If Tony Evans's history is one to rely on, then Robert Drew's The Drowner is the myth not to be missed. The Drowner, together with the shark net, in my view Drew's finest pieces about the West, put some literary flesh on the historical work of Evans and others. And I quote from Drew. After dinner, O'Connor had outlined his bold scheme to build the world's longest pipeline to pump water 350 miles from the coast to the goldfields. But I'm not here to butter up people with swans, O'Connor told Will. I'm here to appraise the best materials and methods in England and the continent and to employ the most imaginative young engineers to join me on the project. Later, O'Connor spelled it out for him in the back bar. It might be all beer and skittles here. They want the bloody water to arrive. But in the city, the attacks on him were getting more, more petty and malicious. They're not thirsty here, and every man thinks he's competent to make engineering and economic judgments. And Forrest has gone into federal politics, so no bastard in, in Parliament has the courage to stand up for me. And finally, uh, on an anniversary night like tonight, from Drew. As he neared the jetty, he rode his horse over the lip of the tide and through the line of grey waves into the Indian Ocean. 
The breakwaters he'd built here had altered the configuration of the coastline, changed the surf, dictated how the tides behaved. The waves were smaller and snappier south of his new harbour. He urged the horse further out to the sea. The chief faced across the ocean and took a revolver from his jacket pocket. O'Connor's fame and the reverence in which he is held today is all the more remarkable now given the modern norm that the publicity for the good work of, en of engineers generally attaches to their employer, either the private enterprise entrepreneur or company or the government responsible for the public works of the day. And that's before the, th the free character analysis or assassination as the case may be of engineers as a class, including the one I heard as long ago as the University of Western Australia Law School uh, engineering faculty rivalry, namely that an engineer is someone who is good with figures but fails to have the personality of an accountant. <laughs> the rivalry in my time at law school was very, very uh, robust. <laughs> Tony Evans's dedication to his book is, and I quote, to our civil engineers whose work is indispensable and yet whose names are seldom known to the public. He describes civil engineers as a, quote, sadly anonymous profession. Or as Drew puts it in The Drowner, and I quote, You've never considered what it is that I do, have you? What engineers do? She looked at him steadily. Tell me what it is you do, Will. He takes a deep breath and speaks very slowly. We change the order of things. Author James A. Michener's aphorism that scientists dream about doing great things but engineers actually do them was always unfair and untrue of scientists, but never truer than with Charles Yelverton O'Connor, Western Australia's engineer-in-chief from 1891 until his tragic death on the 10th of March 1902. O'Connor has become a legendary figure whose major achievements have underpinned the industrial, mining, agricultural and commercial development of our state. He built a water pipeline that has lasted 100 years. When it was completed at the peak of the gold boom, the population of Western Australia was 140,000. The gold rush had trebled the state's population and before the pipeline, the water ration in the gold fields was half a bucket a day. Gold output in 1900 was one million ounces. At today's price, rough calculation, that's worth about 1.3 US dollars or 1.5 Australian dollars, billion Australian dollars. After the pipeline, the goldfields boomed and the population explosion triggered the expansion of agriculture to feed the new city of Kalgoorlie Boulder. What foresight to build a pipeline with the extensions and maintenance, which still services today's wheatfield and goldfields population. Western Australia over the last 110 years, without a Fremantle Harbour or a goldfields and agricultural water supply scheme, is unimaginable because these iconic pieces of infrastructure a part of the fabric of our daily lives, part of the fabric by which we live. Perhaps because this and other essential infrastructure is so much a part of an unnoticed background to an, to, to an in the main comfortable existence that their creators, the engineers, remain anonymous and their public policy and political sponsors so important. If O'Connor's experience tells us anything, if an examination of his work tells us anything for the future, if there is any lesson from the outcomes to date for the future, it is that great social and economic development, great works, are invariably controversial. Controversial in the public eye and therefore controversial in politics, media and government. The true test of a great work is whether it stands the test of time as a productive economic and social contribution. As well as the capacity, skill and professionalism of individuals like engineers, with a great like O'Connor or mere mortals. The building of infrastructure which changes state and national social and economic outcomes requires the political will, courage, commitment and leadership of the government of the day. In this, the 111th year since the construction of the Goldfields Pipeline, I want to underline this evening the vital role of infrastructure in making our state and its people productive and positive, productive and prosperous and the great responsibility of government to lead in the vision, commissioning and ongoing delivery of essential social and economic infrastructure investment through infrastructure. Government in the modern era does need to ask and measure objectively 
What is the state of our infrastructure needs? Utilising independent bodies such as Infrastructure Australia at both state and federal level can assist in this process. Asking what contribution Western Australia has made to Australian nation building and what, no what more needs to be done is also sensible. The creation of the North West Shelf liquefied natural gas industry out of remoteness is a modern day example of such a contribution, as is the creation of an iron ore industry, built as much, if not more, on a computerised railway system as on the quality of inland iron ore deposits. Water is also a good example, and not just limited to O'Connor's day. The need for the reliable delivery of water throughout a large landmass state like ours is as vital today as it was in O'Connor's time. We turn on the tap and expect safe drinking, drinking water to come out. In many parts of the world, our reflex expectation that water will flow is an unattainable luxury. We may well have a modern follow-on to O'Connor's pipeline. The Western Australian Government under Jeff Gallup's leadership was the first in Australia to invest in desalinisation as a major contributor to the water supply. It was highly controversial at the time, but with a drying climate, the investment in desalination is now seen to have been a game-changing decision. Or as Will puts it in the, in the Drowner, a changing of the order of things. When Premier Gallup pressed the button to build Australia's first large-scale public water supply desalination plant in July 2004, it was criticised as expensive, energy-hungry and extravagant compared to other rain-dependent sources. The critics wanted to take the cheap option and rely upon the rain and groundwater, which is also ultimately dependent in the, in the long term on rain. The Perth water desalination plant in Quinana came online in 2006. It makes 45 billion litres of drinking water a year. That's 17% of Perth's water supply. The ability to deliver water within two years was possible because the Water Corporation had been planning for desalination since 1999 as part of its emergency response in the event of continued reduced inflows to dams. The engineers had anonymously been working in a back room on the solution. A reminder that infrastructure development requires foresight and advanced planning. With the completion of the Southern Seawater Desalination Plant at Binning Up, south of Perth, a further 100 billion litres of water <coughs> is produced a year. These two pieces of infrastructure now provide almost half of Perth's water needs. The achievement is a fundamentally substantial one, but the engineers behind it remain largely, if not entirely, unknown. Other states have now followed Western Australia's leads. Together with the pipeline and the railway system, O'Connor's other great legacy, Fremantle Harbour, remains the most valuable piece of economic infrastructure in Western Australia, handing $30 billion worth of cargo in the last financial year. These days, the Fremantle <coughs> Port Authority analysis of the port itself is, and I quote, while the harbour has been deepened and facilities extended and modernised over the year, the basic structure of the inner harbour remains essentially unchanged to this day, testament to O'Connor's boldness, <coughs> brilliance and foresight as its designer. Fremantle Harbour plays a key role, accounting for 78% of all imports arriving by sea. As an exporting state, WA leads the country in terms of the value of exports, accounting for more than 40% of overseas trade. Ports are both the essential endpoint and limiting factor of our success as an exporter. Capacity, efficiency and integrated land-based freight infrastructure are the essential elements of maintaining and expanding our export capacity. All these matters are primary responsibility of government, not the private sector alone. Perth's modern electrified railway system is another infrastructure success story not free from controversy or difficulty. The closure of the Perth to Fremantle railway line in the late 1970s was itself highly controversial and in my view, both then and now, clearly a mistake. Its reopening, however, did not occur by itself and required substantial political will and policy commitment, setting the scene for the system's sub subsequent electrification and expansion. The Perth to Mandurah rail line was a highly controversial yet essential government decision as part of the construction of the expanded line. 
the, the tenacity of the then State Transport Minister, and now my successor as member for Perth, Alana McTiernan, for seeing it through, has been widely acknowledged. Opened in 2007, the Manja Rail Line is now the busiest in the state and carries 70,000 passengers a day. Now, the saving of the system from closure, its electrification and expansion, will form a public transport corridor and spine that will help ensure that whatever car and road challenges Perth have, we will not be consigned to a wholly Los Angeles experience. In Western Australia today, we still suffer from a deficiency of public infrastructure, which we need to overcome to make our capital city more livable and our state more productive and reach the enormous potential which our state and people have. This includes those elements of a complex social environment that meet the physical and social needs of our community. The solution, for example, to Perth's traffic congestion cannot simply be to build more and bigger roads which can act simply as a magnet for more cars. This warning has come, not just from planners, in some respects, surprisingly, from the Western Australian Heart Foundation, which is seeking to see integration of urban design and public health. The Heart Foundation have urged government to turn spending on its head. Instead of spending money on roads first, then public transport, with cycling and walking paths, poor relations, government, they say, should spend in the opposite order, and put investment into walking, cycling and public transport first, with roads secondary. That's a complete reversal of the car-dependent suburb approach that has historically made up much of Perth's urban sprawl. To consider issues such as these requires a big and smart investment in urban infrastructure from government at every level, local, state and commonwealth. Productivity, sustainability and livability will become the criteria through which specific policy proposals will be measured into the future. Economic consultant Synergies recently released a report into Perth's traffic congestion. They found that Perth's motorists would save 73 hours of driving time a year, or the equivalent of nearly two weeks annual leave, if traffic congestion was cut in half. To make that sort of dent in traffic congestion, they, they postulated there were two ways to go, road or rail. Synergies estimate, estimated the road option would require 2,000 kilometres of new road lanes at a cost of 40 billion. The same target using rail would cost 25 billion, which would remove over 160,000 cars on their estimation from roads during peak hours. Confronted by huge and expensive and complex problems such as this, perhaps we should ask ourselves, what would O'Connor think? What would O'Connor do? His answer would inevitably be, in my view, build rail. On the other hand, the federal government has recently refused to fund urban rail projects in Western Australia while happy to maintain road funding. The state government has put the Max Light Rail and Airport Rail Link plans on the back burner. At the risk of being presumptuous, O'Connor's great achievements and history do mean that we can be certain of some things. He would not think in the short term. He would not take an easy option. He would be bold and visionary and require those around him to be likewise. In the modern day, that would mean taking a, step, uh, taking a step back, looking for an integrated solution, taking the best option for long-term productivity, making public transport a priority, looking at where jobs are located and ensuring that people can live close to community infrastructure, thinking about and looking at intently at what these days is called distributed networks, where transport, energy and technology are delivered to communities through local hubs or nodes. I'd also like to think that if O'Connor were here today, he would take advantage of tools not available to him more than a century ago. Advances in digital technology, the vision of the NBN to provide access to these advances. One thing we can be absolutely sure of is that O'Connor would be limited neither by his imagination nor by his courage. Uh, any apology as required to AG Tony Evans, Robert Drew and David Wish Wilson. Can I thank Anna Blake and her staff for being of assistance to me despite my recalcitrance from time to time and general disinclination, to, disinclination these days as a private citizen to deal uh, with the media. Thank you very much for the honour and opportunity of addressing you this evening.